Wolverine has a healing factor. A healing factor so strong that you literally cannot kill him. But wouldn't that mean that certain elements of his body are going to be enticing to others? Maybe others who need blood to survive. What if they could get a regenerative blood and drink that? Today we're going to be covering Wolverine's 2022 run. Now today's issues are one through five where we're introduced to a lot of the stuff going on in the storyline. Then we're going to be skipping over six, seven, and eight as those tie into the X of Swords storyline. Nine, 10, and 11, we're going to come back because we're going to be dealing with a member of Task Force X. And then 12 and 13, we're going to be wrapping up the original storyline as we discover these individuals who are trying to take parts of Wolverine's body. This is going to be the Wolverine versus Dracula full story. This is Comic Storia. I take some of your favorite comic books, I break them down into these audio dramas, and I read them back to you and have a blast doing it. But the whole idea here is so that you know storylines that exist in the world of comics and where they fit into the overall narrative. This allows you to decide which ones you should be adding to your collection, so I highly recommend supporting your local comic book store. Now let's get into Wolverine number one from his 2022 run that ties into the Krakoa era. As the Marauder is loaded up with cargo, Kate taps her foot stating that he does know that they shove off soon, right? Another half an hour and she's going to dump the hooch into the bay. Wolverine tells her, Sorry, there was a problem on Marrakesh. The professor asked to, and Kate stops him, telling him, I'm sorry, what? You're sorry? Jean already told me that you were playing hide and seek with the little nose pickers. Has Wolverine gone soft? I wasn't playing. I was teaching them wilderness survival skills. Kate laughs, grabbing him, pulling him on board. I'm just messing with you. But because you're late, you owe me a few minutes. A few moments later, as the glasses are filled, Kate toasts, stating that she knows that he's not one for feelings, but he does seem a lot happier. Like Krakoa has brought out a better version of him. The only thing is that he has awful taste in booze. She can smuggle him in the finest malt, but he insists on drinking the cheap stuff. Either way, you do look happy, Wolverine. That's all that matters. Krakoa is our home, and you're surrounded by people who you love, even if you won't use the word. He finishes his drink, telling her, You're not wrong, but enough of this heart-to-heart -heart stuff. You were about to shove off, and you brought me here for a reason. What's the trouble, Kate? She sighs, telling him that he already knows that the Hellfire Club is responsible for the medicines that the human countries get them from. They control the key chain from production to delivery, but they're somehow losing product. It started off as a few pounds here and there, the quarter shipment, and then on one occasion, a full load. They got a lab on Mars and in the Savage Land, and everything gets delivered the old-fashioned way, by ship. Sometimes mind pedals go missing, sometimes it's antibody pedals, but they have no idea who's responsible or even where their product is going. Meanwhile, over in Baltimore, Detective Jeff Bannister looks at his crime scene, stating that it looks kind of funny. He got called in because they suspected the cartel on cartel violence. These poor guys, they killed themselves. Screwdriver to the head, glass pipe it to the eye. All of these wounds are self-inflicted. What the hell were they even baking here? It's not heroin, it's not coke. Nah, this is something new. Just taking a whiff of this stuff and you can tell it's not right. Normally, drug labs make you feel like you're sucking on a tailpipe of a bus, burning hot garbage fuel. But this smells like gardens and grandmas, floral. It's like pollen. But as the new street drug pollen gets its name back on Krakoa, home of the X-Men, Wolverine goes to see Sage to see if there is any way to possibly track down the missing petals. She tells him it's hard to determine because of how the petals react to the weather. Mainly for them to survive, they would need to be in places that are cold. Wolverine looks at the map and sees a mark asking, Russia, just outside of Moscow? Guess that's where we'll start. He calls up X-Force, consisting of Kid Omega, Domino, and Jean, stating that they need to get on the ground as soon as possible with this. Jean tells him that they need to be careful. Whoever they're dealing with is not afraid, and they're pulling all of this off undetected. That could mean. But Wolverine asks, Inside job? No matter the case, we'll get it taken care of. But while the Gateway prepares to open up a portal, back in Baltimore, Jeff waits patiently in a hospital when he finally is told that she is awake. He walks in and a frail voice tells him, Hi, Taddy. And he looks at her. Hey there, pumpkin. His daughter asks if he got his work done, and he tells her, kind of, or not really. 
She asks, You know how they're waiting on those special drugs, the antibody petals? The ones that'll make me better? Yeah. Well, people are stealing them and using them for other stuff. Bad stuff. They're making your daddy really mad. Later over in Russia, a priest is gathering his followers, telling them that the gods walk among them. There is no mistake that the X in X-Men, the X-Gene, tilted is a representation of the cross, a symbol of the higher power, because the mutants represent eternal life and... Before he could finish, Wolverine enters with his team. Sometimes Sage is a little too damn precise with her calculations. It is a miracle! We are in the presence of greatness! The gods themselves have been delivered to our house of worship. It is time for communion. First, we must taste of the Krakoan host. Let the pollen bloom inside. And now that we have tasted the flesh of the flower, it is time to drink the blood of the vine! As the priests and the cultists begin to drink the pollen drug, their eyes turn green and they start to hungrily reach out to the X-Men. After getting some ground, Jean says that they are not the enemy that they are looking for. They believe that if they consume the polyp, then Krakoa will bind to their DNA and make them something more. Wolverine pops his claws with a schnick. Everyone maim, not murder, unless they don't give you the option. Shortly after the fighting begins, the followers all begin to drop dead as Wolverine asks Kid Omega if this is his doing. June says that it's not, it's the pollen. So the next night in a bar in Moscow, Wolverine walks into the mob den and everyone pulls out their guns as he tells them, Don't bother. If I wanted you dead, you'd all be dead. One of the men snatched the bag that Wolverine is carrying and set it on the table, and as it's opened, they all step back. The boss looks at the severed head of the priest as Wolverine asks if that looks familiar to them. The boss waves his hand. The conversation is over. And just as the thugs all begin to move in, Wolverine slams their faces into the table, popping two claws, punching into the mob boss's throat. You might want to talk while you still have a throat. Where'd you get the petals? The boss simply tells him from her, the pale girl. Wolverine pulls the claws back and the boss continues telling him that at first she was the one that they were dealing with at the flower cartel. She sells them the pollen, but only if they work for her and she takes 80%. So they started stealing petals from hospitals in Sokovia, tried to garden them themselves. It does not make the pale girl happy. She says that they work for her or else. Or else what? The boss pulls down his glasses to show a scar in his eye that she made by taking his lighter out and putting the flame to it. Cooked it right to the socket. Because she made him. She has her own kind of drug. She gets in your head and makes you do terrible things. And this is why they have psionic dampeners to protect themselves from her. So the next day, Wolverine finds himself in Alaska, letting his body put itself back together, trying to make sense of what just happened. He looks through the icy winds and sees her, the pale girl. He pops his claws out. It was you! You made me do it! But the pale girl fades away and Jeff and his agents run up asking, who made him do it? What is he doing out here? Who the hell is he even? Wolverine falls to his knees as he begins to wonder the same thing. However, moments before, Wolverine found himself face to face with some of the most vicious villains he has ever faced off against. Like always, he won in a bloody fashion. But after driving his claws into the last, he blinks and realizes that the one he just stabbed was Gene. He looks around and realizes that the ones that he just killed were his teammates, Kid Omega, Domino, Gene. No, please. And in one desperate attempt to ward Wolverine off, Gene releases a blast, ripping Wolverine apart. The next time he woke up, he found himself on a table in the healing gardens with a healer telling him that it was all just a dream. He looks at his bloody hands, asking if it was. How did he end up here? Healer says that CIA agent Jeff Bannister dumped him off at the gates. Says he owes him a call and a beer. How long have I been out? He looks down at Bishop and Healer says long enough that what happened to him is happening to the others. So later at the hatchery, Wolverine walks in trying to piece things back together, but while his brain struggles to even connect to the memories, he sees Cyclops watching over Jean's pond. Wolverine tells him that he never meant to hurt them, to hurt Jeannie. Even though they have the ability to come back to life, to be reborn in these new bodies, he never meant to hurt them, and he's going to make things right. But Cyclops turns, realizing that the friend that he trusts with everything just murdered the woman that he loves, and he walks away. Later that day, Wolverine bites the top of his beer off, and he spits out the cap, with Jeff stating that if he needed a bottle opener, he could have gotten one. As Jeff is watering his lawn, he tells him that he doesn't know how good it is to have a good lawn. It's one of life's pleasures, one of the few things that he can control. Now, 
If you've got grubs or a mole or a creeping Charlie, any one of those things will eat into your hard work and if left unchecked, mucks up all of your sweet Kentucky bluegrass. Do I negotiate with the mole? Do I relocate the grub? Do I rip out most of the creeping Charlie to let a few tangles remain? No, because it's an impossible situation to win if you don't take proper action. There's only one answer. You kill it dead. And Jeff takes a swig. Bingo! The scar on my head. It was from when I was younger. Got caught in the crossfire of some mutant showdown. Collateral damage in one of their endless wars, and it's happening again right now with the pollen. Widespread collateral damage, Wolverine. And it's you mutants' fault. Even though us humans and mutants don't work with each other, what we saw up north, we don't have a choice. We need to figure this crap out and kill it at the source. Wolverine finishes his beer, telling him, Killing happens to be my specialty. Let's get to work. After tossing his bottle onto the lawn, Jeff just turns to him. Dude, seriously? Later out in the Pacific Ocean, Jeff and Wolverine search to see about the missing shipment Agent Millie said that they found on the radar. Jeff asks if they're being approached, and Millie says no, and at that moment there's a schnick as Wolverine stabs Jeff from behind. And Jeff won't be reborn in the world of the mutants. As the pale girl replaces the image of Millie, she says that the enemy has been with them all along. And now with Wolverine under her control, he smiles as he grabs the wheel. But while driving, Wolverine follows the pale girl's directions, thinking to himself that he has lived a lot of lives. Each of them he wished that he was someone else in some other place. Some versions of him have been weaker, some stronger, some sadder, some wild. However, no matter what odd or broken bits of his brain remain, no matter where and when he finds himself, he always has his gut instinct. That has always been his true north, because somebody who takes the time to think things out and plan ahead is somebody who believes in a better future. He has never been that guy. He is trying, and that's why this time he had a plan. And before long, in the middle of the ocean, a giant subaquatic facility begins to rise. But just before embarking on this plan to approach the giant subaquatic facility, Wolverine went to ask for some help and assistance from Kid Omega, who is very against dying again. Being murdered by Wolverine is not a fun thing. As he leaves, the cuckoos tell him that they think that it is hot, that he is taking on the Pale Girl. And while Kid Omega seemingly changes his thoughts of taking on the Pale Girl, the cuckoos tell Wolverine that he better keep up his end of the bargain and set them up on a date with Kid Cable. Back at the subaquatic facility, Wolverine pulls his boat in, seeing a massive station run by the Russians. Everyone seems to think the non-treaty nations are fencing themselves off, but Russia's been doing the opposite, it would seem. They think that they're about to move away with a payload of crack Cohen pedals, but they're about to receive some unwanted cargo. As the cargo bay is opened, Wolverine steps out wearing Magneto's helmet along with Iceman, Pyro, Bishop, and Storm. As the fighting erupts and Pale Girl looks out, Kid Omega begins to gloat, how he had to harness Wolverine, how he had to go through a phantom version of Wolverine's psyche and body for her to mess with, to create an entire version for her to mentally conquer. And he played this game of mental chess and beat her. He won the Oscar, the Nobel, and the Pulitzer. As he continues to pat himself on the back, he's suddenly cracked in the back of the head by Jeff, who isn't under any form of psionic protection. Down in the bay, Wolverine tells Storm and Pyro to find the lab and destroy the crop. They will handle things out here. The two quickly head deeper into the facility and begin to torch it while Wolverine heads off to settle his score with the pale girl. As she begins to leave, she tells him that she doesn't need to get inside of him to control him. Magneto's helmet might protect him from psychic controlling, but it doesn't matter. He thinks his friends are his strength, but they are his weakness. He suddenly stops looking back to see Jeff holding a gun to his head, telling him, to not step any closer to the pale girl or Jeff will shoot himself. Wolverine slowly walks towards Jeff, telling him that she is in his head. Think of your daughter, she's sick, remember? And once close enough, Wolverine snatches the gun as the pale girl's hold begins to fade. As he turns around, he realizes that while he was saving Jeff, she fled. And even though she managed to escape, the pollen operation has been stopped and the medicines are now going to the people who need it, including Jeff's daughter. As Jeff and Wolverine share a beer, Jeff squirts some hand sanitizer into Wolverine's hand, telling him that he might have a healing factor, but his daughter doesn't. I owe you a lot of beers and many thanks. You got me off the waiting list for the medicine. You saved her life, not to mention mine. Wolverine tosses his empty bottle onto the lawn, and Jeff tells him, I know what's going on, you're defecting. You're so convinced that you're bad, Wolverine, that it gets in the way of you being good. I saw you, the blood in your hands, the blood of your friends. That doesn't wash off. And if you can get over being a monster, anyone can. 
Jeff's daughter hops off the swing set, runs up, asking if he can stop drinking beer with his grumpy friend. They take her off for pizza. Jeff laughs. I guess he is my friend. Should we invite him too? As the two head backstage, sends Wolverine a message that the Quiet Council is demanding his immediate presence. Something about him going rogue and stealing Magneto's helmet? Jeff looks back, asking Wolverine what kind of pizza does he like, but sees a small potted gate. And Jeff's daughter asks, what are they supposed to do with that? The Quiet Council is silent as Magneto's helmet is thrown to the ground, and Wolverine tells them he's probably going to want this back. Magneto tells him that if he ever so much as, the Wolverine stops him. I got you drunk and I took your helmet. Whereas once you took the adamantium off of my skeleton. How about we call it even? Charles then says that they invited him here not for a lecture, but for a request. In the future, they would prefer to work cooperatively. Magneto brings his helmet to him, telling him, let the barbarian go. He is but a mindless weapon, a blunt force instrument. Charles then begins to speak to Wolverine directly in his mind. Please, when you mock our government, when you insult and embarrass Magneto, you endanger what we have worked so hard to build. Wolverine smiles. Then he probably won't like that I also used his helmet as a piss bucket. But later that night to cool off, Wolverine heads to the middle of nowhere Canada, where he gets himself a drink at the Red Tavern, a place where the floors are dirty with sawdust to soak up the blood and vomit and bullet holes in the walls, and teeth are in the urinal. As Wolverine walks in, the bartender tells him that a storm's about to hit, so if he's coming in, he's staying for a bit. Hope you're thirsty. Wolverine puts his change into the jukebox, telling him, I'm always thirsty. As Hank William Jr.'s Whiskey Bent and Hell Bound begins to play, the man at the pool table asks if he's kidding. Of all the songs you picked this crap, Wolverine sits at the bar telling him that he plugged 20 quarters into the juke. So there's a whole lot of steaming pile of crap on his way. The man takes the pool cue and breaks it over Wolverine's head as he tells him, if my drink spilled. The bartender tells him that it's a good thing that it didn't. And Wolverine turns back to the man, breaking his nose with a headbutt. As the man stumbles into the bathroom, Wolverine asks, who was that guy? He's got a familiar stink, but I can't quite place it. A short while later, an officer runs into the bar, slamming the door behind him. Oh God, oh jeez! The bartender asks what's going on, Peterson, and Peterson tells him, I was driving along County H when I saw it. There's something eating a deer. I couldn't see what it was, but it had to have been a grizz. Hopefully it didn't follow me. The bartender tells him to relax and have a drink, and he can be on his way after the storm. So Peterson takes a seat, everyone begins to have a couple of drinks, and as Wolverine begins to look at an old woman near him, he asks her, Have we met before? My memory's a bit fuzzy. Suddenly everything begins to get a bit fuzzy, and he stumbles to the toilet, and as he grabs the edge of it, he sees blood. He looks over at the next stall to see the man from before with his chest ripped out, and as he takes a closer look, he notices a tattoo, one that has been stitched onto his brain. It was Oregon, many years ago the Brotherhood Militia. At that moment, the officer walks in, shooting him with a tranquilizer dart. As Wolverine begins to ask what the hell they think they're doing, the bartender tells him, we all know you're guilty as hell, and we know who you are. We know you're playing human. All the others don't know that you're here. You come in once or twice a week. We can shoot you, cut you, pour a swimming pool of poison down your throat, and it ain't gonna do much. Slowly, Wolverine begins to recognize some of the faces, and as he looks over at one, he tells them, you were from the Dunwich Sanitarium. You were a patient. As everyone begins to step away, Peterson asks what they're going to do. They can't kill him. And the woman says that they're going to ice him. Literally. Wolverine is then dragged into the frozen lake. And as he's going, he demands to know why they're doing this. What is going on? The bartender tells him, I used to bartend in Madripoor. A brawl broke out and I was at the center of it. A chair thrown hit my fiance in the head and cracked her skull. Blood clot killed her a week later. Wolverine looks at the old woman. What about you? She asks him. Do you remember Gorgon? Well, there was a reason that he has such a disturbing taste for older women. My dear son had what you might call mommy issues. Bartender says that there are support groups for people affected by the mutants. And when he started coming here, it wasn't hard to find people online who wanted payback on you. The silent man from before then takes out a chainsaw and cuts a square into the ice. I may have done some bad things, but I didn't kill that man from before. I don't know what ripped out his chest, but it wasn't me, and we need to stop it. As he begins to sink into the ice, freezing over very slowly, he begins to smell a very familiar smell. <laughs>
And that's when he sees Peterson's head thrown across the ice. If you want to live, you've got to let me go. But it's too late. The long metal tendrils of Omega Red lash out, killing everyone, and he slowly begins to walk forward. I've been following you, and you know why. Because we are the shame. We can only tolerate so much sunlight. Darkness is our truth. The tendrils reach into the ice, and Omega Red goes on telling him, I came for a drink as well, but instead of rot gut whiskey, I'm drinking pain, and your pain is delicious. But what Wolverine doesn't see is the swarm of demons flying down and a single vampire. Later, Wolverine finds his hand suspended in a block of ice, and a voice asks, you're not dead. Oh well. A drill begins to break through the ice and into Wolverine's neck, and the bit is then pulled back out as his blood begins to pour out. As the blood is collected, Dracula takes a small device connecting it to Wolverine's chest. With your blood, we can become daywalkers. He looks at the other vampires, telling them, You will go on as planned. I have a nation to run. And as the vampires leave, some teen vampires sneak into the barn. Holy crap, he is in here! Looks like we got ourselves a juice box. They unhook the block of ice and set it on their snowmobile and begin to take off. And as they drive away, the block of ice begins to bounce and crack. And after so many hits, Wolverine breaks out screaming. The kids ask themselves what they should do now. And as they begin to take off, Wolverine begins to hunt them down. He tackles one off of the snowmobile, popping his claws. And the female teen yells, don't kill me. We are actually trying to rescue you. The kids explain that they don't want blood. They desire it, but they don't want it. They're rebels to the graves. They're actually eating off animal carcasses. So Wolverine sits down, catching his breath. The kids tell him that they don't know about the other one that arrived a day ago. And Wolverine asks, Who brought me here? Was he big, red, and ugly? The girl tells him, No. The one that brought him here is the man in their heads. Like a song you don't want to listen to. Dracula. So later, the teens take Wolverine to an abandoned lumber mill, telling their stories. And Wolverine asks, so you thought that my blood could cure you? The girl tells him that it will probably taste better than these moose smoothies they've been drinking. And Wolverine says that he might be able to help them in another way. Maybe they make a stand. But after carving up some of the logs and mounting them to the snowmobiles, Wolverine and the teens begin to ride back to town. As they arrive, Dracula's vampires all stand guard and they leap into the air floating, letting them pass. Wolverine jumps off his snowmobile, letting it crash into a truck, and the vampires fly back down and begin to attack the teens. Wolverine launches himself back, but not before the two boys are killed. And as one of the vampires turns to the girl, she hits a button and a blade shoots out of the back, slicing the vampire's head clean off. Wolverine stabs into another one, asking, Why are you doing this? And the woman laughs. Freedom to work night and day. He gave us time through the blood clocks. If we kept you, the rest of our kind would come find you. But we aren't ready for them yet. Wolverine asks, yeah? Well, time's up. And he crushes the blood clock used to allow her to be a daywalker on her chest. And then he gets up. That's it for you and Omega Red. As the night begins to settle down, CIA agent Jeff Bannister sits in his backyard as he watches the Krakoan gates light up. He grabs a beer, popping open the top as Logan walks out, stating that it looked like he earned a cold one. Wolverine takes the bottle, telling him that it's more like a long life. And Jeff tells him, tell me about it. Wolverine finishes the bottle in one gulp. And Jeff stops him again. No, seriously, tell me about it, Wolverine. So he explains that there are some rotten spots in his memory banks. Sometimes forgetting is a curse. Sometimes it's a blessing. When he looks back, it's like the spinning cylinder on a revolver. The bullets whirling in a blurry circle. Just so many deaths to choose from. Back with Team X, he, he did a lot of bad things. There was an oil platform, one of the biggest, responsible for 4.5 million tons of oil a year. They were supposed to make it look like an accident, which meant that there would be no survivors. For a month, the sea burned. For a year, the tide carried death in it, all for profit. Soon, Wolverine shakes his head. Aren't we supposed to be talking about CIA business and not our personal lines? And Jeff chuckles. That's right. There's something going on behind the scenes, like really behind behind the scenes. They call themselves the X-Desk. The mutants are in their crosshairs. Meanwhile, elsewhere, a woman is watching on a monitor stating, and now we're watching you, Agent Bannister. But the next day back on Krakoa, Omega Red steps out of a darkened cave, sniffing the air like a predator hunting his prey. 
He finds a flower with a little bit of blood on it and tastes it. And he begins to track the prey that left it behind. He comes across a bear licking his lips, quietly beginning to sneak up when he trips a snare. Hanging upside down, Gabby appears out of the grass. I knew you'd come. He said so. Release me, or there will be hell to pay. Gabby pops her claws. You know, you really shouldn't threaten kids. As she cuts off part of his hair, Omega Red frees himself and grabs a hold of Gabby. You received my warning. Now you'll receive my punishment. But at that moment, Dakin leaps out of the brush. Omega Red offends off both Gabby and Dakin, telling them, I thought we were all supposed to be brothers and sisters on this island. Such rank hypocrisy. Then a voice says that he told them that he'd handle it himself, but they insisted that it was a family affair. The sounds of claws popping can be heard, and Omega Red jumps back as Wolverine says that he wants to know what happened up north. There's some foolish talk about enlisting him in the fight against Russia. Omega Red glares. For the last time, I never followed you through that gate. I never held you below the ice in that river. I never handed you to Dracula and the Vampire Nation for bloodletting. But from what I'm hearing, you're not the only one vulnerable to bad memories as of late. Whatever you think you know, you didn't. Don't make enemies out of friends, Wolverine. Not at a time like this. After a little scrap, Wolverine gets a call from Sage, telling him to report back immediately, and Wolverine says that they'll finish this conversation another time. A short while later in the lab, Wolverine looks at the holographic recreation of a crime asking what is it? And Beast tells him that Sage can cull from blueprints, photos, video, and eyewitness accounts a holographic replication of crime scenes. So it's like a CSI version of the danger room. Got it. What am I looking at? We're going back to the black site. A dozen people were killed and over $5 million in damages incurred. With a particular target in mind, Wolverine. Why would anyone care about Team X, Beast? That's ancient history. There was blood that was found. Sage tells me that it's mutant blood. And besides you, there are only two other mutants who might have an interest in Team X. One of them is Creed, and he's accounted for. The other is missing. Agent Zero, a.k.a. David North, a.k.a. Maverick. Beast then reveals that he's been keeping watch on Maverick's Mercs group, seeing how the raid on the government black site could only have been carried out by people of that caliber. And after digging into it a bit more, the Legacy House has been mentioned. Sage finishes tying Wolverine's tie. Your job is to gather intelligence, so don't destroy anything, or drink too much, or chew with your mouth open, or say anything rude. Sage pats him. Basically, don't be yourself, Wolverine. Through the dark web, we've arranged your invitation into the Legacy House auction, along with a bottomless bank account for bidding. Beast then tells him that it's possible that they have mind-wiped Maverick and made him into their own personal operative. Remember, you are there to observe the situation with Maverick. Observe the auction selling mutant body parts. So later in Magipore, Wolverine fixes his suit as he walks into the Love Hotel, and an old woman at the desk asks if she can help him. I'm looking for some expensive company. Heard of Room 13 is where the action's at. Room 13's going to require a deposit of 400,000 baht. And Wolverine lays out a stack of cash. The old woman smiles, taking the money, giving him a key. Enjoy your visit, Mr. Patch. And I'm sure looking forward to bleeding some money out of this auction. Once inside, Wolverine takes note of all of the villains and would-be bad guys all bidding on different things from Hank Williams' guitar to the blood-spotted trench coat worn by Al Capone. After grabbing himself a drink, a man steps onto the stage, tapping the mic. All right, folks, how about we get this hoedown started? We have, as always, a wide collection available for the silent auction. We'll orbit the room and you'll be able to bid on them at your leisure. These items include the cyanide tooth of Black Widow, a prison painting by Jigsaw, a goblin glider, the gloves of Magnetic Man, and the gravestone of Spider-Man. And as we all know, mutants are especially hot to trot right now, so I'm pleased to offer you the severed hand of Wolverine. Wolverine grits his teeth, crushing the glass in his hand. What the hell? How in the hell? When in the hell? Kingpin hands Wolverine a handkerchief to wipe up the blood, which Wolverine does discarding the cloth, only to be picked up by a passerby. 
He maintains his silence, allowing the auction to continue, and the merchant says that they're about to unveil their prize hog of the night. The reason why he suspects that most of them have arrived. Hard to put a figure on something so invaluable, but the bidding will open up at 20 million. Behold, the mutant known as Maverick! He has been mind wipe, a deep clean, let's say. So you'll be provided with a clean slate. It goes without saying that he is prized as a perfect weapon. But of course, we'll need a demonstration. Billy Joe. One of the guards walks up throwing a punch, which Maverick catches, quickly snapping Billy Joe's arm, slamming him to the ground while driving a knife into his shoulder, all done in a matter of seconds. But while the numbers fly for bids, one of the security guards walks up and whispers something into the merchant's ear. Is that right? Well, I'll be tickled pink. The merchant then announces, We have a bit of an exciting development here. We have for once a surprise item on the block tonight. Please stamp your boots and holler a welcome to Wolverine. As the spotlight shifts to Wolverine, he pops the claws and quickly begins to fight his way to the stage when he suddenly is frozen in place. Merchant holds out his hands, wearing magnetic man's gloves. Ha! Would you look at that? Caught myself a bronco bull with a magnetic lasso. But while suspended in the air, Wolverine thought back to when he was just coming out of a mind wipe. He was thrown back into a cell when he heard a voice, Maverick's voice, telling him, Your name is Wolverine, right? That's your name? Now listen, listen carefully. Today is a victory over yourself of yesterday. Wolverine begins to repeat those words as he is floating on stage by Maverick, telling Maverick to listen to him. Today is a victory over yourself of yesterday. They don't own you, just like Team X doesn't own you. After saying it a few times, something clicks, and Maverick grabs a hold of Merchant, pushing his gun to his head, telling him, I don't know who you are, but I'm getting the hell out of here. And Wolverine looks down at him. Yeah, that's my boy. Look, you just came out of a mind wipe, but you can still lose yourself. Just follow my lead and we'll get out of here, Maverick. Can you do that? I need you to say okay. Okay. Wolverine goes on explaining that the man that Maverick has in a headlock, his name is Merchant and he's bad for business. He needs to tell his goons to drop their weapons or he'll end up with a hole in his head. The Merchant struggles to breathe, telling him, You heard the man! Put down the pieces! Merchant disarms himself of the magnetic gloves and says that they should know something about him. A collector like him always has something up his sleeve. At that moment, a miniature pistol springs out and he takes a shot at Maverick, hitting him in the mask, telling him, did you know that this pistol once belonged to Frank Castle? With Merchant slipping away, Wolverine asks if he's okay. Do you still got your head on your shoulders? And Maverick groans. I'm good. The hurt's good. It's waking me back up. As the entire place begins to empty out, all of the security guards rush the stage while Wolverine and Maverick fight their way towards the exit. Merchant takes aim with his gun, but before he can fire, he is shot in the back by a taser from the woman who was watching Wolverine and Jeff speak the other night. As she reaches down for Wolverine's severed arm, CIA agents rush in and she tells them that she'll be taking them too. Acquire the mutant targets. And one agent responds with, Yes, yeah, Special Agent Ramirez. With bullets now flying from both sides of the room as the CIA is fighting against the black market brokers, Wolverine begins to run. I love cracking skulls, but this ain't a fight we want to be in. Maverick and Wolverine take off, with Maverick asking what is going on, so Wolverine tells them that he's assuming it's the CIA. They both make their way outside and attempt to sneak within the crowd quietly, but the CIA agents run out and the fighting resumes. As Wolverine is attempting to push them all back, he tells Maverick that there's a gate to Krakoa about a half a mile from here. They just need to, but Maverick stomps him. No, I don't need Krakoa. I go my own way now. I run the group the Mercs. You should join me, Wolverine. The Mercs helicopter arrives, lowering a pair of ropes, with the two of them grabbing. The Mercs aren't exactly my friend. Yeah, we're friends to no one, Wolverine, but that doesn't mean we're enemies. We're loyal to no one except ourselves, and something tells me that you can relate. As they make their way to a hidden submarine in the ocean, Maverick removes his mask. You really should consider joining us. It could be like the old times, except no one ordering us around, not a president or a general, not a Professor Thornton, or Professor X. Krakoa isn't like that. Krakoa's family. Ah, you're drinking the cult Kool-Aid, Wolverine. Unbelievable. If you join us, it'll be like the old days. Shadow ops, cracking heads in safes, taking out who needs to be taken out. Wolverine finishes his beer, crushing the can. 
But as he attempts to leave, Maverick asks him to just do one job, for old times' sake. Wolverine wipes his mouth. The old times weren't that great. But if you pop me another cold one, I'll think about it. So Maverick goes on explaining that Merchant was a client of the Mercs, so he knows where the Legacy House's warehouse of collectibles is located. Wolverine and Maverick break in and they begin to torch everything down, but while looking at the boxes, Wolverine spots one marked Team X. He starts to open up the box, telling himself that he made an effort at piecing his life back together, remembering what he can. But he also realized that there's a certain freedom in forgetting. He slams the box back shut, stating, What the hell? We're gonna let this burn. They both walk out as their memories and their past begin to burn down with everything else being collected. The next morning, Wolverine brings Maverick to Krakoa. He's surprised and tells him that it isn't bad. Wolverine tries to give him the pitch. Krakoa is the mutant's own country, a home, and that's a good feeling. You should give the Kool-Aid a try, Maverick. Are you even listening to yourself? Because you don't sound like the Logan that I know. If the past few days weren't clear enough, I have no plans to go digging around in the past. I very much like who I am now, Wolverine. He begins to walk out of the gate, and Wolverine tells him, If you ever change your mind, you have a home. And Maverick tells him, Same to you, Wolverine. Thanks for the save. So a few days later in New York, Maverick walks into a coffee shop to meet with Special Agent Ramirez. He takes a seat, stating that if she wanted to do business with him, all she needed to do was ask. Ramirez takes a sip of her coffee, telling him that she was pleased to hear that he wished to do business, but he must understand that his recent visit to Krakoa has made her a little cautious. Now she would very much like to know where his loyalties lie. The waitress walks up asking if they need more time to decide, and Maverick looks at the menu. No, I've already made up my mind. But back with Wolverine, now that he's back in Krakoa, and Maverick is off following his own path, he sets his sight on his original target from before, where our story began, Dracula. The Vampire Nation has been targeting small towns in the north, filling up their trailers with bodies to supply the nearby big cities. They think they're being quiet, but Wolverine can always pick up a blood trail, and he can sniff out their graveyard rot. Then comes the reaping. While dealing with the population control, Beast and the others haven't exactly taken their eyes off of Omega Red, who seems to not really be settling into Krakoa as a new home. While observing him, Omega Red took a gate out of Krakoa, bringing it to Ukraine, which he then boarded a plane. He then flew over to Chernobyl, where he jumped out. Chernobyl is fitting, yes? What a better place for a kingdom of vampires in an irradiated wilderness that no one dares step foot into. Omega Red washes up on the shore, and he sees a pack of vampires feeding off the wildlife. Take me to Dracul! The vampire asks if he thinks that he can just demand the company of the king. You aren't worthy! The vampires bear their fangs, and he dispatches them with ease as a voice tells him, Forgive their rude welcome. If Chernobyl is the throne, then these are the peasants begging at the gates. Omega Red looks up at Dracula, floating down. If there's anything that Charles Xavier and I have in common, it's an understanding that true power is exclusionary. Dracula then begins to sniff the air. I can smell his blood. Wolverines. I can't keep doing this. The mutants all fear and despise me. They suspect me no matter what I tell Wolverine. <laughs> you just need to earn their trust by offering them something. What? Offer them Russia. Wolverine later finds himself following another lead that brings him to Paris, where he's looking for the help of a friend. As he sits in the church, a mosquito bites him and he slaps it. And after drinking some of his blood, it regenerates and then flies off. A woman claps her hands together, catching that mosquito. You never answered my letter. Louise of the Night Guard tells him that she has been occupied. She cannot say she welcomes his visit. He always seems to bring blood with him, no? Wolverine tells her, that's the problem. They got a taste of my blood and now they want more. Yes, well, I would have responded to you sooner, but times are dark. There is a member of the Night Guard stationed in every major city in Europe, and once a year they, as vampire hunters, come together for a gathering. However, their guiding priest, Father Cole, has betrayed them. She isn't sure how many of the Night Guard made it out alive, or... Or what? It's nothing. The two begin to walk through the street with an older woman tripping. As Louise sees blood on her hand, 
Her eyes begin to turn red. She helps the woman up and Wolverine grabs Luis and pins her to the wall. You didn't make it out of that meeting alive. And she pushes him off yelling that she isn't one of them. Not yet. She regains herself, telling him that she is fighting off the vampire infection with garlic and holy water. But it will be inevitable. Wolverine holds his claws out a bit longer, then retracts them. Part of me is tempted to take your head off right now, but the rest of me understands. I know what it's like to lose control of yourself. So Wolverine takes her into a dark alley and lets her drink some of his blood. But up high, Father Cole is watching. Later, after composing herself, Louise sits down telling him, Paris is a city of lights, but she fears as though she is living in the shadow space between true darkness and light. Not quite human, not quite a vampire. Perhaps his reason for calling her was so that he could end her life, maybe before she is too far gone. Wolverine tells her to hold on a little longer. I told you about those vampire kids up north, right? They stayed true to who they were, Lord knows that I've fought plenty of darkness inside of myself. As long as you can keep that hungry part of yourself caged, you can still do good. Besides, monsters sometimes have the advantage when fighting other monsters. At that moment, Father Cole jumps out of the shadows with his fangs and claws aimed right at Louise. Wolverine lunges in, swiping, tackling the father. But Cole manages to roll with him and kick him off the building. Louise begins to throw stakes at Cole to keep her distance, but Cole catches them. That is enough. Listen closely, because my voice is an echo of the voice already whispering inside. He is already inside of you. He is inside all of us. Dracul. I am here to invite you to join the new Night Guard. Help us secure Wolverine and you will be rewarded. Luis begins to break away. No! Get out of my head! But before Cole could try to influence her any further, Wolverine calls out to him that Notre Dame translates to Our Lady. And Our Lady ain't happy. Cole turns back with Wolverine taking one of the crosses atop the building and impaling him with it. And as they return home, Wolverine brings Luis to the armory, where Forge constructs Luis a new suit to block the sun, along with a new sword laced with UV, allowing her to fight against any vampire. She tests the helmet part of her suit, and Forge tells her to look at that. She's basically a walking, talking battle coffin. Your giant head doesn't need any more inflating, Forge, but nice work. Luis gives Forge a kiss on the cheek, Merci beaucoup. And Forge tells her to watch the neck. The two begin to plan out their next hive raid, with Sage radioing to Wolverine that he's needed at the point. They make their way there, and Wolverine sees Omega Red standing there, immediately popping his claws. What are you doing here? Beast jumps in between them. Wait, 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 wait. Omega Red has a proposal for us. Whatever he's selling, it's a lie. The Vampire Nation owns me. I will give them to you. But you need to make good on your promise of amnesty. Let me be my own mutant instead of living in the shadows of your island. I can't help but suspect you, Omega Red. What's your move? Spit it out. Omega Red extends a tendril, swiping at Wolverine's cheek. The move is actually yours. Dracula wants you. So how about we just give him what he wants? Several days later, in the catacombs of Paris, Dracula gathers his closest, telling them that they've all lived in the shadows for far too long. He was the first experiment. I had a taste of Wolverine's blood, allowing me to walk in full sunlight for a day. With another sample of Wolverine, I've shared the gift of daywalking with all of you. I took risks and the wrath of the mutant nation in hopes of sharing this gift with you. And now it is your turn. Dracula reveals that he has, in fact, somehow, captured Wolverine, announcing that soon they will all be able to walk in the light. But for now, the Chosen among them will have access to this private blood bank. However, soon the vampires, who have taken some of Wolverine's blood, begin to feel sick. In the days leading up to Wolverine's capture, Omega Red made good on his promise to give Wolverine to him. However, it was a modified version of Wolverine, one created in the hatchery of Krakoa, and then revived illegally, as the mutants don't allow clones to be walking around if the real one is there. This empty bodied version of Wolverine, Omega Red brought that as a husk of the original. Beast called it a dirty bomb. He tainted the blood and his infection was now spreading within the vampire community. As at that moment, the real Wolverine and Luis attack the catacombs. They carve their way forward, but Dracula transformed and escaped, leaving his coffin to rot with the dirty blood that they were given, swearing that when he returns, 
we will see who the greater monster is. However, now that Dracula is free, Wolverine turned to another potential ally in this fight. He takes Luis to the kingdom of Sevelin in the realm of the other world to meet with a society of vampires who will become more sophisticated than the mindless, power-hungry vampires of Earth. The vampires here are considered to be royalty and see Dracula as a beast just seeking immortality. Luis presents her case to the elders, asking for their help in purging this coarse strain that is Dracula from the Earth. The elders tell her that if she is seeking an ally in death, then she has come to the right place. I hope you guys enjoyed today's episode of Wolverine. Now, we're not done with Wolverine. There is another 10-issue arc that we're going to be working on. This involves Deadpool. We find out what's going on with Maverick and who took that arm of Wolverine's. But if you want to read this yourself, go check out Wolverine issue 14 and read from there. You can skip over the Axe event, but other than that, it all ties in to one overarching storyline. And if you want to see more videos like this right here at Comic Story, and I highly implore you to please give me a like, subscribe, and hit that notification bell. It does a lot more for us than you realize. And if you want to get parts of the storyline as we're completing them, sign up for our YouTube memberships or join us over at Patreon. Overall, thank you guys so much for your continued support, and I'll see you next time right here.